it's difficult. Uh, okay, I'm going to have a really um, interesting slide deck on how to communicate with management. And I thought about as a joke, uh, just to make one slide. <laughs> Some of you have dealt with management before. Okay, too much, right, too many slides. Okay, so um, first of all, security doesn't matter. Serious, executives, boards, higher management, they just don't care about security. They do, right, because it's part of the overall business, but is the security as a subject, as a discipline, they don't care. They don't, and just get over that. I mean, you may love this stuff, I love this stuff, I've been doing this for years and years and years, it's very important to me. Um, I get like, you know, frothing at the mouth and foaming and bang my fist and jump up and down and it's super cool and they just don't give a shit. It's just the way it is. It's not part of their life. So these are some of the things you might have heard from executive management, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've been running just fine. Why should we change anything? Don't change anything if things are doing just well. There's no need to do anything different. This is the way we've always done it. Terrible solution, right? We would never have advanced if we maintained, maintained that mindset. Air gaps, isolation, we're air gapped, right? We've got firewalls. It's, I love it when they put that in the same sentence for you even, right? It's like it's just low hanging fruit for targets. Uh, there are no more air gaps. There may be some air gaps out there, but they're the vestigial dinosaurs of modern life because no one can do business like that anymore. Because ultimately it is about business. And that's what I'm going to talk about. It's never happened to us, so why should we worry? Right? Well, as we've heard all throughout the day, well, you're probably not looking. There's all kinds of other reasons why this myth doesn't make any sense and should go away as well. Uh, again, this is what we've, we've always done it. Part of this is that insanely high operations cost. I mean, you've seen industrial facilities, right? They're massive. They're incredibly well engineered. Do you think that much metal and engineering comes for free? Hell no. That's insanely expensive. Your security stuff is a drop in the bucket in terms of what it costs to start, maintain, fight for, site, all of the nonsense that goes in just getting that plant day one operational, much less maintained and sustained. Your security budget ideas don't really matter from a financial perspective as well. Ultimately, security just can't compete, but risk can. So I'm going to teach you basically different words to use when communicating with executives. It's really what it comes down to. So first things first, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You'll lose. That's how it is. Uh, if you show up to management unprepared, you will walk out of there with nothing. That's not the goal. You want to walk out with something. And I'm going to get you to the point where you can actually, at the bottom of the slide, you can see close the deal. So know yourself. We'll talk about some things that you might need to do yourself to think about how you're presenting first. Talk about knowing the business that you're in. In some cases, people forget about this part. They think about security and industrial control systems and forget the business side of the aspect. Know the executives. They're still people. They still do things just like everybody else does. They do put their pants on one leg at a time like you do. But they are still people. And there's certain uh, nuances to their personalities. Um, know the risks that matter to them, not you. You usually go into these discussions knowing the risks that matter to you. This has to get flipped and you need to speak to their risks, the, their mindset. How to prioritize for business versus security. This is very important because we always prioritize for security because that's what we do. We think about security first. They don't. It's not their priorities. And then, of course, uh, the language. It's important to know how to speak their language. They do speak a different language. It, does, it involves a lot fewer syllables. Sometimes it's pretty pictures. As Rob Lee mentioned, he's a cartoonist. His book is actually for children and management. There's a reason that clause is in there, right? And then knowing how to close the deal, because this is what they do. You have to use their terms and think like they think. Close the deal with a conversation with them. Okay, first things first, let's talk about knowing yourself. Look in the mirror. Anyone from a third-party consulting firm in the room? I am. Okay. We're brought in most of the time to say the same thing you said in the exact same words so management will listen. Right? Am I, raise your hand if I'm wrong. Every single time. They don't listen to you. They don't. And you could be the smartest person. You could have invented the damn protocol, the device. And they're still not going to listen to you. This is important. Understand you're coming from the inside. You're already up against a barrier. They're not going to listen to you. 
you don't know anything because you work for me. I don't care how much I pay you. Okay? A lot of folks are really good. They're damn good at what they do. They may even be the best at what they do. But in that room, they don't care. Kill your ego. When you walk in, you have to approach this as though they don't know who you are because they don't. And they don't care who you are. Why are you here? That's important. Tear your ego down. Go in blind. Go in knowing that they really don't care who you are. And that's okay. And it's good. It's a very good exercise just in your professional life anyway. Degree certs, whether you presented here, there, S4, Black Hat, DEF CON, Derby, you name, pick a place, CS3. Uh, I don't care how awesome your presentation was or what you've got in your technical background. Like I said, you could have invented the device. You could be the world's leading scientist in the device and the protocols. They don't care. Technical chops, don't care. You get the picture? You're just another face that works for them that they don't want to listen to. Okay? When you go in, you're going to think, oh my God, this is serious. And they're going to say, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to accept all that risk. And you're going to walk away empty-handed. This is very common. Usually because you said it the wrong way. So be prepared to accept, in some cases, way more risk than you want, and we'll talk about why, and in some cases, not as much, but you will definitely accept more risk than you want dealing with management, because they rarely see it like you do. And it's exceedingly difficult to get them to see it the same way you do, because they don't have the same experience that you do, the same depth of technical expertise, the same understanding for the priorities, uh, the, the likelihood, vulnerability, threat landscape, all of that stuff is stuff you've studied for a long time. You can't convey that to them in one slide. It's going to take a while. So this is where you start, not where you finish. Be prepared to repeat yourself with different words. Who's got kids? <laughs> right? This is exactly what it's like. You're going to say it once, and they're going to go do the exact damn thing you told them not to do, and you're going to say it a different way, and they're going to do it again. And you're going to say it a different way, and maybe after the 50th damn time, they're going to figure it out, and they'll go, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to do that, or I'm supposed to do it that way. It's the same thing. You're going to have to say it a bunch of different ways because they don't speak your language. You've got to say it the way they want to hear it, which sucks, but it's a reality. Last piece, most important bullet on the slide. If you do not have soft skills, you will fail. Most of us are very technical, and our soft skills aren't that great. So we've got to work on those. I would say that is the biggest key to success in management, is learning how to just convey your concepts in ways that are easy for others to understand, that are not technical in any way. How do you take something that's insanely technical and literally put it into some slide deck that's got one slide with like frowny faces and smiley faces on it? Serious. Those soft skills matter. Your ability to distill technical stuff into things that someone at Starbucks could understand on any given day is where you're, that's your job. That is the key. Let's get there. Okay, we'll start by knowing your business. What business are you in? Are you in water, you in chemical, refining, oil and gas, electric? Your business is what matters. That's their world. They're CEO of a company in this business. If you think they don't know that business, you are utterly wrong. They know their business. If you come to that discussion and you don't know your business, they'll run you out of the room. So know what your business is. Know it well. Know what it looks like. What are your competitors? What's the market right now? What is your stock price? How many employees does the company have? How old is the company? Because really old companies rarely change quickly. They change really slower than most. Like they're going to be buried and you're going to dig them out, and dust them off with some archaeology students in the next 50 years. They change slow. Smaller, younger businesses can change a little faster, but in anything in the infrastructure space, in the ICS space, they all change slower than everybody else. Old ICS companies change even slower. It's glacial pace. Um, governance. Know how the company is run. Is it an investor-owned company? Right? Do you have shareholders you got to satisfy? This is very important. Is it a private company? Is it owned by one person that's got lots of money and a lot of ideas? Which happens. Think uh, what originally was with Tesla, for example. Is it a municipality? Are you part of some city, county, state, government of some kind? Why does this matter? Well, because those people aren't really 
running a business, they're running a public service. And in most cases, they get elected. So they basically have to deal with things like constituents versus shareholders and constituents because the shareholders are the constituents, right? Is it a cooperative where the rate payer is part of, part of ownership, okay? All these things matter. Multinational can be a very interesting animal because now you're dealing with markets and uh, various, I'll say, external influences that are in everything from different languages, different colors, different currencies, all this good stuff. It's very difficult to deal with a multinational industry. Um, product diversity. Vertical integration. Does anyone know what vertical integration means? Okay, it's a handful. Okay, this is typically in the utility space, not in all spaces, but in the utility space. Do you own the source, the transmission, and the distribution of the product, right? Electricity is a fantastic example. Oil and gas is another one where the source, generation, really drilling, whatever it might be, transmission, getting it from that source to where it's used, and then distribution is the last mile where it's used. If the company is vertically integrated, the dynamics can be just in insanely difficult compared to just what? We do just drilling. We do just generation. We just do transmission. Because in a lot of cases, this has to deal with multi-state issues. So the market looks very different. Multiple state regulators that, that the, your company has to deal with, for example. And then multiple industries or supply chains. The more diverse the company is, the more difficult your supply chain looks. And in a lot of cases, it becomes multinational just because of the supply chain. In most cases, it can already be. But it gets worse so uh, in this case. Where does your product get sold? Are you a wholesale deliverer or do you have a retail side? The, all of these things matter to the business. Most technical folks don't give a damn about any of this stuff. But if you go into this meeting not knowing this stuff, you are unarmed. So let's put on your executive hat for a minute. Pretend you're an executive, which is difficult. Um, you know some stuff, usually really well like you're good at operations, or maybe you're a lawyer, uh, maybe you've got a multiple different business degrees or finance background, whatever it might be, you're usually really good at something. And you're not good at anything else. You're kind of you're kind of shallow in those other areas. But you've got to look like you know your stuff everywhere else, right? You've got to look like you know. So typically you surround yourself with people that know that better than you do, and you lean on them in, your, in this circle of trust. But the worst thing is you don't want to come off in front of the board or shareholders or anyone else at your peer level as though you don't know. So it's kind of fake it, right? You, and if someone challenges you in that space, typically you get pissed off and you run them out of the room. It's just, that's just how humans behave. I don't care who they are. Um, you're usually damn good at business or you wouldn't be a C-level. Sometimes, um, I like to say dead wood floats, <laughs> other things float. Um, it, it, ha it can happen, um, but the reality is typically they are not a C-level of an organization that has this much you know, money flowing through it if they don't know their stuff. They're probably very adept at what they do, so never underestimate them. I mean, you may think that they don't know technical stuff, that's probably the only thing they don't know. Everything else about that business, they know inside and out. An executive um, can get fired for pretty much any reason. Anything goes wrong with the company, who's usually the first person to, to, to be on the chopping block? CIO, CSO, usually. Uh, CIO, CEO, right? We just saw some CEOs step down this week, as a matter of fact. Uh, Portland, not Portland, sorry. Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E. So they'll be filing for bankruptcy, I think, towards the end of the month, and their CEO just stepped out. First head to go. So, it's very simple. Everyone has you in their crosshairs. Why? Well, usually the customers get upset about it because they don't like the prices, right? Everybody else at your level wants your job. Shareholders, if they like you or don't like you, it depends on the day or the what they had for breakfast. Uh, in some cases, but everybody has you in their crosshairs. You are constantly covered in laser dots and filled with arrows, nonstop. That's just part of the job. comes with being an executive. You typically have gotten where you are because you're highly competitive and you're very unwilling to lose anything or any argument. That's very common for executives. Um, be prepared knowing that's just the personality type. You don't care what people think of you. 
or what your decisions are or what you're doing. You're there to make money. You've got a purpose. You've got a job. Personalities and feelings just don't matter. That's really common. And then typically, as I mentioned, you have a small circle of trust. Uh, you have people that you trust to provide you advice. And if it didn't come from them, then you don't trust it, no matter what's said. And this is important because in some cases, if you need to get a message to this level, find out who they trust and who they lean on to receive that information. And you can somehow work through that path. So what, what, is, what do executives actually speak? If they don't speak tech, they don't care about all these things that, we've, that we typically do, that what do they actually speak? Well, they speak risk. They also speak basically profit and loss. Let me give it to you in a real simple sense. It's really about profit and loss. And risk is essentially that loss component or the inability to continue to profit the way you want to. It's the same equation. They're just yin and yang of one big topic, right? So we're going to talk specifically about risk for a minute because it's about risk management. And I want you to break down the concepts of risk because if you do not speak to them about their risks and their inability or ability to make money or offset loss, then you will not win. It's really just simple enough. Risk there's a lot of really big, fancy uh, ways to do risk. Like there's some qualitative measures, some quantitative measures. I don't care how big the equation is and how fancy it looks. It comes into two things. It's like probability or likelihood, same thing. And then consequence, impact, same thing. Some variable of one of those two things. How likely is this thing to happen? And what, what happens if it does actually you know, really happen? What's the, what's the consequence? The risk options. So what do you do once you know those things, right? What do you do with that risk? Well, you got... There are three choices. You can accept that risk, do nothing. You can mitigate the risk, do something. Or you can transfer the risk, make someone else do something versus you doing the something. Most executives will opt for first, accept the risk. That is usually the first path. Because if it was a big deal, why, did, why am I just now finding out about this? Right? Their first option is going to be there. That's why I say you're going to have to come back and say it a different way. It's going to take a few trips to get your message across. First option is going to be accept. Second option is going to be to transfer. <laughs> Just get some insurance. Move it off to a third party. Outsource it. There's lots of different ways to transfer that risk somewhere else. That's your second option. Third option is actually to do something. So you can see you've had to come multiple times with successive messages, different ways to get them to actually do something. That's just the reality of the picture. Okay. Unless you have something so compelling that they're willing to jump and do it right away. Very uncommon. One thing about executives that most people don't understand is it's not their job to manage risk. It's their job to take risk. It's not what you think. It's their job to take as many risks as they can and hopefully nothing bad happens. Because that makes them more profitable. And even if something bad happens, a good example is the bg e executive. She made that company a ton of money. She's stepping aside, stepping down, doing the right thing. Everyone's wondering, well, who's going to hire her now? I mean, look at the disgrace. <laughs> Someone will hire her already, yesterday. Why? Because she made that company a ton of money. That's why. We think it's about keeping the lights on. We think it's about providing the water, the gas, all this stuff. No, it's about making money. They're in business to make money. <laughs> That's it. That's all they do. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be there. It's this person's job to take lots and lots of risk. It's your job to keep them from messing it all up. They are doing a counter job of yours. They're running in the opposite direction as fast as they possibly can with like a boatload of scissors, throwing them at everybody, and you're busy trying to clean up the mess. Get that, embrace it, and fix it. That's your job. It's not easy or it'd be done already, right? Okay? It's a reality. It's their job to take as much risk as possible. So when you look at the number of risks that they're dealing with, we think security is a big deal. There's so many other risks that you can't even imagine on their landscape that you probably have never thought about. Some of them, we'll go through a little quick list here. It's confidence, brand integrity. Again, it's about money. If they can't sell their product, big deal if they're secure. They can care less if they're hacked. Honestly. So brand integrity is, is a big deal. Whether the market has confidence in them, this is, um, think about things like, are there, what's a big deal now as we go through this, arguably the next you know, renaissance, everything is getting disrupted. 
even our you know stodgy old infrastructure spaces are getting disrupted in ways we never thought about with things like digital twins and cloud and Brian's going to give where's Brian give a great talk on cloud coming up. Our world is changing. What is the market doing? What's the confidence that your business will survive the length that an infrastructure organization is expected to survive and make the same amount of money in this market? Right? That's a big deal. Shareholders, if you've got them, you got to keep them happy. Because if not, they fire you. If you're an executive, you're out. You're not making enough money. Next, let's go hire the one that just got fired and they made a lot of money. Let's go hire them instead. How it is. Customer confidence is very important in a lot of cases, whether it's uh, wholesale suppliers, whatever that market might look like. If you're selling to an endpoint or you're selling into the stream, either way, whoever's buying your product has to want to buy your product. If for some reason they don't want to, they stop buying, money stops flowing. The source of that income is gone. It's key. Competitor advantage. Is your competitor or competitors, are your competitors doing it better than you are? And if so, why? This is, from them, this is business side. This has, in a lot of cases, nothing to do with the security piece or even the industrial components, right? Credit rating. Big deal. And this, I know, it's like, ah, credit ratings, oh God. If you can't get money to do stuff, your business doesn't go anywhere. And in our business, getting money to buy a $500 million facility, you got like some spare change in the couch, you can pay for this kind of thing. That's an enormous amount of money. Your credit rating matters more than you can possibly imagine. You cannot do anything in our space at all if you don't have a stellar credit rating because everything we do costs just tons of money. Okay, we talked about some regulation. Thanks, JD. Good presentation on regulation. It matters to the business because it's not just about whether or not you're breaking the laws and you're going to get the you know terrible specter of a million dollars per day per violation, which is BS anyway. Um, the, rates, the safety regulations, environmental regulations, they're there for a reason. They keep them from doing things like taking too much risk and killing their own people. It's really what it's about. How do I not kill everyone in my plant or the neighborhood around my plant? <laughs> That's pretty much why regulations are there. Is it's the lowest common denominator where you can accept some risk, but you can't kill a bunch of people. Because lawsuits and stuff like that, people get upset. And then, of course, in regulation, what is often left out of the regulation is typically the rate or cost for your market to do what you do to sell your product. Okay? That has a factor in there as well, because there's everything from market regulation just as much as there is like safety, environmental, or now even security regulations. I mentioned it's about loss. Loss of revenue. Everyone can immediately understand what that means, right? Loss of production downtime or an outage. This is one of the most interesting numbers you can get if you can figure it out. And it's not that hard. How much is it in dollars per minute of outage for your company? Because once you know this number, everything comes into scope. Now you can go to the executives and say, I want to do this, and it will stop. In theory, it will prevent this much outage, this much downtime. We've had this much downtime over time. I'm going to prevent this much downtime. That will save us X amount of dollars per minute. And if your project is lower than the cost that you would have, to, would have suffered to lose that money, you're in. See the math? Know this number. This is an absolutely key number for your success. Losses, human error, equipment failure, safety is a big issue in the human error space as well because lawsuits and, and angry people when they die, you might have violated some regulations at the same time. Uh, equipment failure, well, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you're good at the mean time between failures, and sometimes things just happen and it breaks. Uh, but in most cases, in our world, when it breaks, it's a big giant piece of machinery and the whole damn plant has to shut down and it takes forever to get it back in. Engineers have to come in from some foreign country. It's a mess. We know how this is. Um, Losses can get pretty big there. Costs for loss control measures. They factor this stuff into what does it cost to offset the loss? <laughs> what are you doing to prevent the loss? It's all that stuff that you're doing for security actually fits in this little bullet right here. All the amazing stuff you do in your budget fits into the cost for loss, loss prevention. Administrative costs. Believe it or not, they add that stuff up too. All the management, all the pencil pushers, finance side, project managers. Everyone loves project managers. Liability and insurance, remember, accept it or transfer that risk. This whole bucket, transferal, make someone else pay for it. Well, if we do something stupid, well, someone else will pay for it. That's the thought. 
something to remind them of. It's just like uh, the best example I've got is uh, the like fire insurance. My house burns down. They show up and the fire inspector goes through and does the inspection. And the insurance company finally calls and says, all right, Mr. Miller, we noticed you had no smoke alarms and no, no uh, uh, fire extinguishers. No fire hydrant nearby. Your house burned to the ground. You did nothing. No due diligence whatsoever to even detect this fire or prevent it from happening, so you're not going to get any money. Same thing in this space. If you do nothing and you expect the insurance to cover it, they're going to give you the same spiel. What did you do? What was your due diligence? What was the minimum bar you met to actually show you cared about this stuff? And then they may pay something out. If you just saw the one with uh, Mondelez, uh, Zurich denied their claim for not Petya coming through. Said it was an act of war. No government has said it's an act of war yet. Because an act of war means something very specific in the political space. That once you step in that space, you ain't getting that off your shoe till some guns get fired. Right? No one has said that, but the insurance company claimed it. So now guess what? It becomes a fence post pissing match between lawyers over millions and millions and millions of dollars. You don't want to get to that space. Do your due diligence. This is an enormous amount of money. All the pieces in the insurance, lack of coverage, insufficient coverage, claim management expenses. Insurance is really, really expensive. It's basically legalized mafia. You may or may not get paid, and you may end up losing your fingers in the process. Okay. Product and process, aside from the process engineering and all that good stuff that you've done to get moving, crazy things like tariffs, international business. This is huge, especially in our current market. <clears throat> uh, proprietary information, that's a big deal. You got it. Sometimes it gets stolen. Sometimes people just, it gets legs and it decides to go somewhere else. And suddenly your product is being generated on someone else's uh, floor. Uh, supply chain issues, a big deal. We've talked about lots and lots of supply chain issues. And it's not just the security of the supply chain, but it's actually the availability of the supply chain and what you can get for your products coming in. Uh, workforce disruption, believe it or not, labor disputes and things like how much can I automate and get rid of the people part of it is a huge deal because there's a lot of money being spent on that. And those of us that are in the market now or in the space now know what the automation looks like today. If you go back 15, 20, 30 years, there were people doing those jobs. Now it's a bunch of computers doing those jobs. And in the future, it's going to be a bunch of computers doing the computer's jobs. That's how it is. But that's an enormous amount of money because think of how much cost there was to have people do this. I mean, not just the human resources pieces, but rolling a truck. Everyone's doing anything to roll a truck these days because of the liability issues. So, uh, and the market, the supply chain, demand, cost, purchasing trends, these are all important things. So they're looking at this landscape of threats. So after those three slides, you kind of get an appreciation of what a CEO is thinking about. And that really is the, that's what I could distill it down to, because this could go on for days. I only had an hour. That's their world. And most of that stuff, you're like, oh, God, another slide of risks. Right? They're thinking the same thing. Oh, God, here comes a security person again. I have no idea what they're going to say. They're going to talk some protocols and things. I don't know. For their world, think of it like um, maybe you've uh, eaten a lot over the holidays for the few years or so. And it's time to go to the gym. And you walk in there, and you haven't been in the gym in years. And these machines are freaky, and there's a bunch of healthy people in there working out. And you have no idea what the hell to do. Executives are like this. They're scared of this stuff. They don't know what to do. They know it means like a lifestyle change for them. It's not just buy a widget and turn it on. It's a significant shift in everything the company does. It's frightening. So their, their world is totally different. So you have to fit the problem that you've identified into their risk framework. What I want to do will solve this risk problem that we have. I didn't say security. You're solving one of their risks. If you come and you bitch about problems, they're going to run you out. You come bringing solutions. And you don't bring one solution because they're going to change and make things. They're going to ask you questions and say, well, I don't want to do that. Give me something else. So you're going to have a whole bunch of solutions with you when you come in. Have you thought about it from the business perspective? What business issue will this impact? How are you going to help the business do better? It's not about stopping 12 armed terrorists from coming into the network and taking things down. It's about, I'm going to enhance the business like this. This is how we're going to end up not spending money or we're going to end up making more money as a result of what we would like to do. Root cause of the problem. If you don't know what the source of the problem is, then you can't fix it. If you're trying to come to them and treat the symptoms of the problem, 
they'll notice that. They're really good at smelling this kind of thing. Usually the first question is, how much research did you do? And you got to have an answer for that. Who did you ask? Because they're going to know the business unit in charge of this problem. And they're going to know what they've been doing over the past 15, 20, 30 years. They're going to know everything about that business line. So if you didn't do your homework and understand the business issue, the root cause of the problem, you're not going to be able to say, I need this money for this section right now. It's, it's going to be this vague, uncertain thing, and they get enough of that from us anyway. Gaps. You want to identify specifically what the gaps are. Some easy way to identify gaps in language they understand is we have a people gap, right? It's like skills or lack of people. It's a resources gap. Um, it's a technology gap. We're missing a piece of technology or a technology is too old to do what our competitors can do to beat us. Okay? Or it's going to be a process gap. We've got some processes that need to get fixed because we've now changed some things or we've got to enhance the process to actually get a competitive edge or stop people from dying, whatever it might be. Um, those are some easy buckets to use. They speak that language. Executives absolutely love precedent. They're almost always going to come back with the exact same question. I would say 99 times out of 100, who else has had this problem and how do they solve it? Have an answer for that. If this is the first time this has ever happened, you got yourself a humdinger. Because chances are, in our industry, this has happened to somebody somewhere. Is this information public? Nope. Probably not. It might be, but probably not. That means ask your peers. Come to events like this. Uh, I'll give a plug for the beer ISAC. Go to the beer ISAC. Talk to your peers. Um, but the deal is you got to figure out what else has been done. Because if you come with an I don't know, they go, well, how the hell do you know this is going to fix it? Right? So you got to have some precedent, even if it's something close. Say, I've done a ton of research. I've done this. I've done that. And this is as close as I can get, and it worked for them. That gets you a lot more than uh, I don't know. I think it'll work. Because I'm the guy who made the protocol or invented the machine or whatever it might be. I don't care. Okay. They want some, some, some uh, examples. FUD will not work. Stop doing it. Cut it out. You're hurting yourself. It's really fancy and sexy to tell them, you know, bad things will happen and, you know, terrorists want into your network. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work. And here's why. Security is a cost center, not a profit center. All they think of when they see you is as you're talking, they're hearing dollar signs come out of your mouth. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Why is this person still talking to me and I'm losing money? Go get to work. You're expensive. Security is not cheap. And when you spend a little money on security, you get a little security. None of us in the room are inexpensive. We're all high paid professionals. The market is constrained and our costs are going up. It costs a lot to have a human in that seat. It costs a lot for your butt to be in the chair. So what are you doing to earn your keep is in their mind. Security has a stigma. As I mentioned, it's confusing. It's expensive. You keep telling me, no, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? I just want to use my iPad on the golf course and check the process. Um, yeah. But the reality is, uh, it, it is. I mean, that is, we're always running around saying no, and that's how we're seen. We're seen as the, the department of no. Um, that's, that's how they see it. They already think they're spending too much on security. I guarantee it. They're, they already think they're spending way too much on security. And the cost of security only seems to get more expensive every day. How many different tools have you bought in the last 10 years, if you've been doing this for 10 years? seems like every year or less, there's some new widget I got to buy. Whether it's a piece of hardware or a piece of software, I got to buy some new widget tomorrow. And it's going to like solve all my problems and, and save the day. And then, then there's another widget that I got to use and another one. So now you're you know, maintaining this rack of space heaters that are supposed to be doing good stuff for you. And you just keep buying more and more and more. And that's what the executive sees is I'm buying more security crap every single year. And how am I not getting more secure? Why is it this way? There's good reasons for that, but being able to explain that to them in like three words with some, you know, red, yellow, green charts, not easy, right? Scaring them into action can backfire on you. There's, like I mentioned, why are they spending so much on security if it's not going to help? And a lot of them will use their catch-all safety net of if it's really that bad, the government will come save us. Which, of course, just takes the wind out of your sails. Like, ah, crap. So any FUD argument dies, boom, with this, it's dead, it's smoking. Reality is if it is that bad, yeah, they'll do stuff like send in the National Guard or whatever your respective company, country has in that case. Um, so why do they have to go to this level? So don't, don't go to like the terrorists and the bad guys, all this stuff. Think about simple things like our competitors are beating us. That gets their ears up. Whoa, no way. I thought we had them. So it's a completely different discussion than terrorists are going to eat us alive and take your children. Um, 
our competitors are beating us. We're losing product. We're losing market share. Those things get their attention. So say this instead of that. Executives don't speak ITOT. They speak business. I'm, I'm going to drill this into you. If nothing else, you will come away understanding this. They don't care about IT or OT. They care about business. Say things like risk reduction, increased or reduced reliability. What you're doing is reducing reliability of the process. It's in What you want to do is increasing reliability of the process. Loss prevention. We are losing stuff here. We want to prevent that loss. And by doing this, we will save things. We will actually go into the profit side versus loss. Operational efficiencies mean you can do things better and faster and cheaper. They love to hear that stuff. Efficiencies matter. A lot more than you can imagine. Increased or reduced uptime, downtime. This one is a big one. Like I said, if you can find out what that cost dollar per minute is of downtime, you got like the nuclear weapon to go talk into the executives right there. Bam. What I want to do will be less than the loss, right? Increases, reduces profit. Of course, that's gold. Once you can actually give them that in a square figure, as I just mentioned. And then anything that from that list of aforementioned risks, think about framing your discussions like that. And if you say the word security once, you should go back to the room and beat yourself about the head, neck, and shoulders because you lost. Don't say the word security. It freaks them out. It makes them itchy and cranky. They don't understand it. Stop doing it. Prioritization. The main thing is if you can get their attention, they're going to want to know, well, crap, if it's that bad, when do I start? It's going to be one or two things. Think about it in terms of tactical. You've got to do this right now because this is bad. And that's again, they're going to think about, oh, well, where am I going to get the money, all this good stuff. And then strategic. When do you actually build this into the, the advancements of the organization? When you make changes, then put these things in. Um, the cost model is the most important thing. So how are you going to get payment or recovery of what you're asking for? Because if you're just asking for more money, your chances are likely going to be no. So how do you figure out where to get the money? And that can help you understand what your priority is because you may have to reframe your idea of how important this is to fix if you can't get the money for it. But if you can and it takes a little bit longer, pitch that instead because now you both win, right? Make it easy. Brand it. Give it a sexy name. Don't call it something technical, right? Give it, a, give it a, an awesome business name that sounds like you're going to solve world hunger to them, right? You're going to make things profitable. We're going, to make, we're going to make the process great again. You want to do stuff like that. Marketing matters more than you can imagine because that's their world. Stoplight charts, up arrow, down arrow, trends. They love to see trends. Trends are very important. Red, yellow, green means, whoa, risky red. We're green. We're doing okay. I can stop spending money there. Or I can take back the brake or pump the brakes a bit. Keep it simple. These bullets here, state your problem, state the risk of what's going on, show how much maturity you have to act currently to fix the problem. This is where we are. We may or may not be able to solve this quickly. We may have to do some training, hire some more people. Cost, you got to know that. Priority, how soon should you be doing this? If you can keep all of that down to one page, they'll get it. Close the deal. These are important pieces. You're there to educate them on the risks and provide a range of options. You're not there to make the decision for them. And if you act like you're going to, they're going to get mad. It's their job. They own the risk. Don't throw anyone under the bus. Don't make someone look bad in the process. You're there to enable them to do good things. So you want to help that area of the business that's doing stupid stuff. Yes, they should be beaten and they should be shamed, but in this case, don't do that. You want to enable them to do good things and you're here to help them. That's much better. It's more collaborative. Executives like it. Educate those offenders and help them fix themselves and grow. Ask for a decision. Tell them you want them to think about it. I don't want to necessarily a decision today, but I need you to, to think about this and come back with an answer. Executives will always postpone the decision if you let them. Actually call for an answer. Just let them know we have to talk about priorities on this. Um, recommend the best path, but be prepared with options. As soon as you say the best path, they're going to say, no, I'm going to take a different route. We're going to do it this way. What about that? So you got to just, worst thing is, throw a throwaway idea out there right away. Just throw it out there. I know I'm going to lose this. Throw it out there. And then they'll say, oh, no, no, no. we'll come back with something. And then have lots of different options to catch. And if you're quick on your feet and you're already prepared with different options, should they go this way or that way, you got an answer quick. You're going to look like you know your stuff and they're likely to take one of those options. So an example, real quick. Um, Problem, lack of operational monitoring of ICS assets. I picked this because I knew it would be discussed today. We're going to call this one Visible Operations. It's got a sexy name. It's going to win, right? 
So your new tools and network design for monitoring processes, you get increased system operational data and analysis capability, faster issue detection and root cause analysis, the engineers love this stuff, increases uptime and lowers maintenance costs. I didn't say security once. Cost is low per network segment. Why? Well, because it's got a high cost uh, and a higher cost recovery potential because it's a minimal cost to go in and all these other things are beneficial coming out of it. The risk, I'm sorry, where am I at now? Uh, capability, high. We're really just inserting a couple of devices. It's not going to be a bunch of retraining, a bunch of network infrastructure overhauls. As we mentioned earlier, if you can get a choke point and monitor that one to see a network, then in most cases you can start there and get, get going. Risk is low. And the priority is strategic. We're going to do this as we make changes to those networks. We're not going to have to just do it overnight. This is something an executive would go, oh, okay, this sounds good. I can do this. Okay, summary, last piece. Execs don't care about security. Do your homework when you go in. Speak their language. Never bring a problem without solutions. Make your message dead simple, easy, frowny face, trend arrows, that kind of stuff for them to understand because they don't know security. Use their words. You're there to help them make a decision, and that decision may be the opposite of what you want. That's okay. Come back later with different words and a new picture. It'll, it'll be, it, it's a, just keep trying. Use different words. Your role is not to secure the company. This is the most important bullet in the entire deck. You may think that's your job. It's not. Your job is, there to, your job is to enable them to make money and keep making money. And it may not be what you want in terms of risk reduction or risk uh, appetites, but it's what it is. Mike, I'm that's it. Thank you very much, yeah. One question? Sure, I'll do one. You, you pick. Okay. That, that's a good path. Um, it takes longer than you want. Um, depends on what you're trying to do. You can certainly get it on the risk register. What I found in a lot of cases is as you're doing that and your expectation may be realistically one to two to three years to get it to the place where it can make an executive level decision. Um, hopefully you can get it done in a year. I mean, that's breakneck speed for our industries. If you can get it done in that time, great. If it goes to two to three years, chances of everything else changing around it is, is now a reality. It used to not be the case, but now it is. We've got a lot more disruptors at their level that they're concerned with. And in some cases, what we thought was important then just drops and other risks just take it, take it away. So um, I've, I've always opted for doing both. So you kind of squeeze them, you sandwich it. You start with that grassroots effort and build it up and then come at it from the top and hit them there too. So if, you, if I would try both tracks. Um, it's, it, depending upon what level of traction and visibility you have in the organization, it really depends on your, your connection to the right management layers and the right players. Because if your only option to get that risk through is someone that the execs already hate, good luck. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.